perfect. So for those of you who have just joined, hi, my name is Evie. I'm the research assistant for the Bus Flies Through Time project. Welcome to Researchers Stories. So today we're having our second talk from the brilliant Jamie Wildman. Um, this is our second talk in the series where we listen to a new bus fly researcher um, every week and we hear a little bit about their research and the conservation that work that they're doing um, towards bus fly conservation. Uh, this series will be running every Wednesday at 7 p.m. until the 8th of June. So Jamie is a PhD student uh, in environmental science at the University of Northampton, researching the checkered skipper butterfly in collaboration with bus, uh, butterfly conservation. In a moment, he's going to tell us a bit about the um, amazing checkered skipper's 200 year story from being extinct, declared extinct in the 1970s to its successful reintroduction in Rockingham Forest. Um, but before that, I'm just going to do a bit of a housekeeping message for you all. Okay, cool. That is all from me. I'm going to hand over to Jamie now. Um, Jamie, off you go. Marvellous. Thank you very much, Evie. I'm going to share my screen with you all now. There we go. Hopefully you can see that. So here we go. Thank you everyone for joining me this evening as I bring you a talk on the extinction and reintroduction of the checkered skipper butterfly, 220 years of history and mystery in England. As Evie has already told you, I'm a PhD student at the University of Northampton, studying the checkered skipper butterfly in collaboration with butterfly conservation. Oh, let's see if we can get the second slide going. There we go, fantastic, right, we're off. So, the checkered skipper belongs to the family Hesperidae of UK skippers. There are eight species of them in the UK altogether. The small skipper, the dingy, the Essex, the large, the silver spotted, the Lulworth, the grizzled, and in the bottom right here, framed by the University Museum of Zoology at Cambridge's lovely eggshell blue is the focus of tonight's talk, our beautiful golden brown butterfly, the checkered skipper. So what is the checker skipper? Well, its Latin name is Carterocephalus palaemon, or palaemon, depending on your pronunciation. It was first described by Pallas in 1771, but it's also known as Papilio paniscus, as described by Fabricius in 1775. It usually flies between the months of May and June, and it's known as being univoltine, so it only has one brood or one generation per year. It was declared extinct in England in 1976, but I've highlighted this number, this 1976, because we'll return to this later on in the talk. And it's known as a skipper as it appears to skip over grass tops when in flight, when the males dart from grass blade to grass blade, or they're shocked, or they're tearing after another invertebrate, they'll tend to skip at high speed over the tops of grasses. But there are differences between the sexes, and we'll go over that just now. Now, my de facto way of differentiating a female from a male checkered skipper is to look at them head on and look at the clubs at the end of the antenna with a pair of close focusing binoculars. You'll notice that the female on the left has a duller, more orangey tip to the club that I've circled at the end of the antenna and a black base. But if you look at the male at the right, Again, from this head-on perspective, you'll see that this club is fully yellow. It's a brighter color, but there is no black at the base. This is always my way I go to. You need the right equipment and you need to be patient, but it will give you a pretty confident answer every time. And there are other variations between the males and the females though, but they're a bit less obvious. The female typically has a broader abdomen and it's a bit shorter as well. Their markings are slightly paler and the forewings, the trailing edge is somewhat more curved as well. Compared to the male, if you look at that trailing edge of that forewing, it's a little sharper. But again, these are much more subtle differentiations between the sexes. But you can see quite clearly between these two images, the male and the female, the male is much brighter, it's much bolder. And the abdomen is somewhat like a pipe cleaner on the males and it has a gingery tuft at the end. But these are only really reliable means of telling the two apart when they're both fresh because wing wear and 
the general lifespan of the butterfly usually results in them losing a lot of these tufts, a lot of the hairs on the abdomen, and a lot of the scales from the wings as well. So it makes it a lot harder, but the clubs at the end of the antenna are usually things I rely upon. The undersides as well are pretty good tell, but again, you can see from the male, this one is slightly later in life. You can see again, that completely yellow club at the end of the antenna, but there's no tuft on the abdomen, unlike the fresh male that we saw in, in the previous picture. Now this very pipe cleaner-esque abdomen compared to the female, which, in this particular image, it looks like she was probably carrying eggs because it's very, very broad. But the underside, again, quite difficult. So we usually go by the clubs at the end of the antenna. The historic habitat of the checkered skipper. Well, it was known to inhabit deciduous woodland rides and glades, woodland margins, limestone grass, and fenland and heathland in England prior to its extinction. There's a lot of historic literature that supports that the food plants of the butterfly were broadleaf grasses such as false brome, tall grass and hairy brome, and nectar on bugle, bluebell, marsh, marsh thistle and bramble amongst many other flowering plants. You have a nice picture of the bugle in the top left of the image there, this pyramidal bluish purplish flower. And a nice image from the south that was actually taken in Belgium in 2018 that gives you an idea of the typical habitat of the butterfly. So we've given you an idea, an idea about what the checkered skipper utilizes for habitat, what it looks like, and what it tends to utilize in terms of nectar sources. So we'll move on to the start of the checkered skipper story in England. In 1798, a new era began. The first record of the checkered skipper in England at Clapham Park Wood, just north of Bedfordshire as stated in the J.C. Dale manuscripts held at the University of Oxford Museum. There was a 1799 record that corroborated the presence of the butterfly at this particular location, which is just east of the present day A6. Shortly after the start of the 1800s, the butterfly began to march northward. It was sighted at Gamling Gay Wood in Cambridgeshire in 1802. And Lennon Jennings notes states that it was taken from Whitewood in June 1803, Cambridgeshire. These two sites are very close to each other, but it would be over 20 years until its next record from Cambridgeshire at Castor Hanglands. And this is a key site in the history of the Checkered Skipper. Monk's Wood appeared in 1829. And there are also interwoven records from other counties in England, Worcestershire, Devon and Dorset, each between 1800 and 1829. North of Cambridgeshire and Huntingdonshire lies Lincolnshire. The first record from the county came from Skellingthorpe Wood in 1843. So we have to ask the question. It was sighted in Bedfordshire, in Cambridgeshire, in Huntingdonshire, and then Lincolnshire. So was the Chequers Skipper's range expanding northwards in the early 1800s? And if so, how? It was then seen at places like Bardley Lion Woods, Bourne Wood, Legsby, amongst others. But it's very notable that even by the middle of the 1800s, the northern limit of the species range was reached. Lincolnshire, I've highlighted here versus Northamptonshire in the east, or to the east of this slide, isn't so key around this time in the 1800s. Lincolnshire is really the focus because there are very interesting characteristics of the butterflies dispersal north during this time. This was really the state of play between 1798 and 1899. There's a tendency for this northward movement, this increase of range upwards past Peterborough towards Lincoln. You'll notice that the cooler colours around Cambridge in the late 1700s, the early 1800s of blue signifying that the records, the first date of occupation in these circles is older and they seem to increase in warmth the further north we go, indicating that the first record from those particular dots is newer. And how has this happened? Well, perhaps it was something to do with the topography. There's something called the Lincoln Ridge, just north and south of Lincoln. And you can see this Great Depression, the wash and the area surrounding the wash to the rest, Boston, Spalding, Long Sutton, those types of places, very low to the ground. These are the lowlands of the Midlands that then progress northward toward Lincoln up past Lincoln towards the Wolds to the east. But there are two gaps, you'll notice, just to the left 
of this red arrow by Sleaford and Lincoln, these gaps in the Lincoln Ridge. So potentially, as we see these flags of occupation by Newark and by Lincoln itself, that the Checker Skipper utilized rivers and valleys that run through the ridge, maybe embankments and other, other linear features to occupy these sites. But you'll notice that they all tend to be on this side of the ridge. And they don't tend to be present, at least at this period of time, at higher elevations up towards 250 or so meters. So we've mentioned about riverbeds. This could be a possibility. And it's backed up by some previous research. Ravenscroft, in his study of the Scottish Checker Skipper in 1992, wrote that he saw a female over six kilometers from a known site. Warren and Ravenscroft in 1996 report said that Checker Skipper tended to occupy a range below a 200 meter contour in Scotland. And there are also historic records that I've pulled from railway embankments, Merefield Railway cutting in 1941 and a railway bank near Wing in Rutland in 1971. And other linear features as well. The Checker Skipper again was sighted by Ravenscroft on a roadside, surrounded by nothing that resembled typical Checker Skipper habitat. And there's a general sense that females, once they've mated, tend to emigrate away from core habitat, perhaps up to level kilometers away from colony centers. So perhaps in these cases where places are being occupied further northwards, it's these spearheading females that are driving away from core habitat to occupy sites new. But we'll come into this slightly later on, that before the 1900s, the landscape was better connected. It was easier for butterflies like the checkered skipper to disperse across the landscape. So we've come up with a bit of a theory through this, that the checkered skipper first colonized the south of England after flying over from France, and then west of the Lincolnshire Wolds via the Midland Lowlands. And I've chatted with some previous researchers, John Moore, who wrote, his thesis on the failed Lincolnshire reintroduction in the 1990s says that there was good habitat around Devon and the New Forest. Tom Brereton, who did a fantastic uh, project on the grizzled skipper, says that he thinks the checker skipper colonized in the south. And he had a very interesting thought that although we started to pick up records in the late 1700s, the checker skipper may have long gone from the south coast before the era of recording collecting started. And there's also a sense that in some places the Checker Skipper was just under-recorded, that there could have been far more colonization, a much greater abundance, and more colonies of the Checker Skipper across counties that just went undetected. So is this a case of bad intel? Developing this theory, is it actually fundamentally flawed? Well, there's a bunch of records from Devon, Dorset, and the Kent, and elsewhere on the South Coast, what I call full, complete records, and those that are incomplete that I've excluded from my main data set. There's lots of records that lead all the way up to the 1953 period from the south coast and an isolated record is perhaps a little bit more suspect from 1975. There's also lots of vague labels that aren't attributed to any particular location. They lack definitive provenance. Places like Norfolk, North Kent and Dorfolk, Dorset and Devon, West Sussex, there could be anywhere in these counties. So as a counter argument, was this perhaps a case of collectors rearing and releasing butterflies, taking them from core habitat elsewhere in the country and then releasing them elsewhere, or just a case of misidentification altogether? Someone told me the other day that they thought they'd seen a checkered skipper, but it was in fact a speckled wood. Now I've mentioned Castor Hanglands and this was the historic home of the checkered skipper in England. All of the Cambridge researchers will be very happy to hear of Castor's dominance in the landscape and its importance historically. There were 86 records between 1882 and 1892 from Castor Hangland, compared to 42 from all other English sites from the same time period. So Castor Hangland's already, by the end of the 1800s, had a dominance. It was really the base of operations. And even in 1961, only 15 years before the cited date of the Checker Skipper's extinction, it was stated as being a metropolis of the insect, that it was very common there, and that the Checker Skipper, according to him, was in no apparent danger of extinction. Collier said of the habitat that it was very much 
a site of former coppice with standards, most of which was then removed in the 60s and 70s, leaving an ash oak woodland with hazel, privet, dogwood and spindle. The grass had been dominated by tall grass, one of the checkers gibbous food plants, false oak grass and a mixture of sheep's fescue and velvet banked. And there are a total of 677 site records between the first record from Castor Hangland in 1823 and its last in 1974, 263 more than any other in England. So that was the story of the Checker Skipper from 1798 to 1899. And we move into the 20th century. And this is when the Checker Skipper became the ruler of Rockingham Forest. It moved west from Castor Hanglands into the rows of the Shires, my home county, Northamptonshire, eventually establishing major colonies at sites west southwest of Castor around the turn of the century. It first was known to have occupied Fine Chain Woods in 1898, Berman Woods in 1902, and Wakerley Woods in 1910. As you can see, Berman is just west of Aundel, and Fine Shade and Wakerley are west of Wandsford, just on the county uh, border between Leicestershire and Rutland, Northamptonshire and Cambridgeshire. And this was the golden brown age. As we head into the 1900s towards the 1930s and 1940s, it was the peak of the checkered skipper in England. Cripps and Humphrey, two collectors, pulled 283 checkered skippers from Firmin Woods between 1942 and 1944. And I'm incredibly grateful to the Museum of Zoology at Cambridge and Magdalen College for donating Cripps's 213 records to my data set. But it wasn't just museum collections that contributed data. There are private collectors out there as well. And a, a Wiltshire collector had only over 70 specimens belonging to Humphrey. Kershaw was known as well as being a prominent collector of the era. 41 unlabeled specimens held in the private collection from 1940 were almost certainly captured by him as they were characteristically badly set, would you believe? Now, these three collector specimens account for 77% of all site records from Furman, 437 of them in all, just these three collectors. Now we haven't really touched on Leicestershire and Rutland and we're coming towards the peak of the Chequered Skipper in the 1940s. There are only a couple of records from Leicestershire and Rutland in the 1800s. But all of a sudden in the 1940s, there were reports coming out from Coppice Lees and Culliger Lane Spinney just southwest of Luffenham Heath Golf Course, just northeast of Barrowden. A young entomologist by the name of John Keith Bates Hell collected diaries, made diary entries about the checkered skipper from this period in time. And I've learned a great deal about the checkered skipper's occupation of sites in Leicestershire and Rutland through his diary entries that are held at Leicester Museum. He makes note of two checkered skippers flying together in a gambling flight over the road between the coppice leaves and the spinney in perhaps something resembling courtship. And I've mentioned Luffenham Heath. Now, Lovelham Heath is in a modern day golf course, but it was once connected to Culliger Lane, Spinney and Coppice Lees and Barrowden by an expanse of scrub and grass and known as Coppice Lees that was ploughed up through agricultural intensification in the late 1940s and early 1950s. And this site, this sub landscape was only 1.6 kilometres northwest of Wakerley Woods, one of the major sites of the Checker Skipper in England in the 1900s. Now, Wakerley Woods in 1940s, again, drawing information from Bates's diary entries. Goods and Tozer and Bates on the 25th of May, 1947, went to Wakerley and between them captured 120 checkered skippers from Wakerley Woods in one day. And this was very indicative of a colony that was in fantastic health. Can you imagine? going to a stronghold of a butterfly species in the modern day, and between the three of you seeing 150 of one particular species of butterfly, let alone a common species like a peacock or a small tortoise shell, but it was a checkered skipper. And now we come on to something called baseline shifting. There's different subsequent generations have different expectations about encounter rates. For them, it was normal to see that many butterflies of one particular species in one day, but for generations like mine, 
is very, very unlikely. I'd call it a fantastic day of butterflying if I perhaps saw 20 or 30 butterflies. It just shows you how landscapes have shifted and people's expectations have had to adjust accordingly. So from 1900 onwards, we have our state of play. These black circles indicate 10 kilometer circles that were occupied, known to be occupied prior to the 1900s. And all of those that are colored were so at some point after 1900 and before 1976. So you can see the extent of the checkered skipper's range didn't really change that much from the 1900s to the year of its supposed extinction. It moved in something of a downward curve from Lincoln toward the top of the map, but was seemingly geographically limited from dispersing any further west, even its dispersal northward was limited by topographic features. And you see there's almost this diagonal line by the Lincolnshire world. Again, as topography shifts, elevation increases, it seemed to be a barrier for dispersal for the checkered skipper. So the checkered skipper's doing fantastically. By the 1930s and 1940s, it's on a roll. Look at the rate of increase in records that we have from this period. You think the checkered skipper's absolutely flying high. It's dominating the landscape, it's here to stay. Well, by the late 1940s, things were about to take a very dramatic shift. In only 26 years after 1949, the Checker Skipper was gone altogether. Its decline was precipitous, it was extraordinarily fast, and caught very many experienced researchers completely off guard. And there weren't many warning signs. According to Lynn Farrell, who I will mention later on, who wrote JCCBI report in 1973 on the status of the Czech Skipper, there weren't many signs from people. Nobody had a real idea that it was in any kind of trouble until the mid to late 1960s. As I mentioned, Pilcher said that the butterfly was very common at Castor Hanglands, even though it didn't enjoy its former abundance. These might be the first clues, but it's only from one or two individuals do we have an idea that Czech Skipper perhaps wasn't faring as well as it used to. But even at Fermin, one of its major strongholds, it was abundant. There were only a fair number by the 1950s, but it was again considered later in the 50s fairly plentiful. But all those anecdotal reports, all this anecdotal evidence didn't repeat what I've collected in terms of specimens. I only have 19 from Fermin after 1950, and I make mention of the hundreds and hundreds that were collected there between a couple of years in the early 1940s, only 10 years prior. In Wakeley Woods, again, returning to Bates's reports, his diary entries, there were very few paniscus about in 48. Apparently they're quite scarce, but other butterflies were abundant. It was described as scarce again in 1949. But again, there are a few indications from these private diaries that perhaps the checker skipper isn't faring so well. So in the early 1970s, a researcher by the name of Lynn Farrell, who now lives up in the Cumbria area, published an internal report for the Joint Conservation of British Insects. Her report on the status of the checker skipper in the British Isles, uh, um, British Isles, sorry, presented a very grim picture. It was picked upon very quickly that the checker skipper was absent from almost all sites that were searched in the early 1970s. Lynn states that she was taken by surprise by how quickly the butterfly declined. Even Ray Collier took until the early 1970s, the ex-warden at Castor Hanglands who knows his habitat or knew his habitat so well at that point, didn't have any idea that the butterfly was really in trouble until the 70s. And Lynn came to the conclusion that decline had happened in the 1960s and many of us until I began my research a few short years ago, understood that the decline began in the 1960s. But from all the thousands of records I've collected to enhance the existing butterflies for the new millennium data set, we've come to the conclusion that the decline started in the very late 1940s and the early 1950s. And we have this, what's called an extinction trajectory in the top right. These vertical red bars, as it sounds, are breakpoints. They mark the point in time at which a gradual trend, this diagonal blue line that you've seen, breaks, it snaps and turns into a very quick decline. And those red lines mark the breakpoint at which this gradual decline turned into a very significant and precipitous one. 
And the statistical models that we've used to generate this extinction trajectory have suggested that decline began in 1947, which in, with an upper confidence threshold of 1948 and a lower confidence threshold of 1945, which sounds about right. And this uses all of the historical data that I've collected from museums, private specimens, published and unpublished text. I mentioned Luffenham Heath. There was no evidence of it being occupied prior to 19, 1968 when Lynn Farrell conducted her research. But just as an example of how powerful museum specimens are, how powerful private collections are, we've now pushed the earliest date of occupation at this site back to 1932. Lynn Farrell said that work at the site and some personal correspondence I've had with her, that work was top secret. And she was even asked by the JCCBI not to publish her report at the time. Word got out amongst a few entomologists and naturalists in the 1970s that the Checker Skipper was at Luffenham Heath. It wasn't common knowledge at the time. And someone by the name of Steve Meredith, who gave a talk for butterfly conservation a few years ago, uh, learned of the site from an esteemed East entomologist that he wouldn't give the name of. And he saw the Checkered Skipper. He didn't submit photographs to the Nature Conservancy Council at the time that the Checkered Skipper was present at the site. And because he didn't do that, his records were considered doubtful. Occupation was not considered very likely. But he presented these photographs at the Butterfly Conservation Talk he gave a couple of years ago, which proved definitively that the Checker Skipper occupied the site at the time. And the Declaration of Extinction was made based on a few sightings in 1975. Uh, a bunch of very distinguished entomologists came to the conclusion that the Checker Skipper would be extinct by 1976. But we've actually collected records since then that indicate that the Checker Skipper was seen in 1976, which would mean that the latest date that the Checker Skipper could be considered present in the country was 1976 and therefore extinction date must be 1977. It's only one year, but it just shows you again the power of historic data. Now, there's been a lot of consensus generally about what caused the decline of the Checker Skipper and they're pretty well uh, substantiated now. We tend to think that the woodland rides and the margins that the Checkered Skipper historically occupied were degraded, were compromised by the development of closed canopies through changing woodland management practices in the 1900s, especially leading up to the 1940s. The abandonment of coppicing, the clear felling of broadleaf woods, coniferous afforestation, high forest conversion, and the loss of ancient woodland. It must be noted that immediately following woodland management like that, rides would have been opened up, canopies would have been more clear to the blue sky above and sun would have penetrated to ride level much better, which would have actually improved habitat for the Checkers Kipper for a while. But woodland, woodland succession without any commitment to ongoing management would have led to these rides becoming shaded over, habitat becoming cooler, flowering plants not blooming, and the Checkers Gibbers habitat deteriorating to the point that it was inhospitable. Agricultural intensification leading up to the 1950s, we mentioned about barren and leaves being ploughed up. We would have seen the loss of marginal habitats like hedgerows, grassland banks on the edge of woodland sites that the Checkers Gibber may have used as biological highways to colonise sites across England that were present before the 1900s, but not so much. From then on. Collier makes note in his 1978 report, again the ex-warden of Castor Hanglands, that almost all permanent unimproved grassland sites were lost. And we even have the delayed onset of myxomatosis, the relaxation of grazing pressure, uh, compromising the quality of grassland sites. And I may mention of insecticides and herbicides as well. It's not something I've looked into, but it could potentially be a driver of decline as well. This is the last photograph of the Checkered Skipper, the last of a generation from Luffenham Heath on 9th of June, 1975, taken by Monty Tyler and George Sellers. The last bastion of the Checkered Skipper, now long gone. But much better news. In 2018, Butterfly Conservation, in collaboration with several project partners, including Forestry England, 
launched onto the back from the brink roots of Rockingham project. We went over to Belgium, the south of Belgium in 2018 to collect the first generation, the founder population of checkered skipper that would be reintroduced to the English landscape. There I am in the middle of the photograph in the top left, Nigel Bourne and Sam Ellis of Butterfly Conservation on the right hand side. And there's Susanna Overeerden on the bottom left, the project officer bore back from the brink. And you might notice a gentleman by the name of Chris Packham who came along on release day and the release was featured on Spring Watch that year. We refrigerated the specimens that were caught after being placed in pots to keep them inactive for the period of time uh, between them being captured and released, which they were then done. They were then brought back over the English Channel and released in Rockingham Forest within 48 hours of being captured. We brought 42 checkered skippers over to Rockingham Forest in 2018. And we were absolutely delighted the following year to see the first ever English checkered skipper for 43 years. It was a fantastic moment knowing that Butterfly Conservation's work in collaboration with its project partners and landovers to improve the quality of the habitat had resulted in a climate that was suitable for the checkered skipper to lay eggs in and for them to overwinter and emerge as adult butterflies the following year. We had a further release in 2019 of 24 Belgian checker skippers, 12 males and 12 females, with a further reintroduction plan the following year. But COVID postponements meant that didn't happen. But I'm really delighted to report that even since that last reintroduction, we've had good numbers emerging in the wood each year with a reintroduction plan this spring also. So since the checker skipper was reintroduced, to Rockingham Forest. I've been deep in checker skipper territory and we've used something called photographic mark recapture. Typically mark recapture involves capturing a butterfly with a butterfly net like we did the founder population that we introduced to Rockingham Forest in 2018 and 2019. But photographic mark recapture means that we can bypass the need to mark individual butterflies and use photography as a means of re-identifying individual specimens. You wouldn't think to know it, but if you look at an individual checkered skipper, or either one on the top left and the top right, you look at the subtleties of their marking and they're different. High resolution digital photography enables us to tell the checkered skippers apart. Solid upper wing shots like this means that a checkered skipper photographed in one side of the wood and photographed in another side of the wood. We can assess its mobility, how far it's flown, how long it's lived for. And this has generated some fantastic results so far, such as a checkered skipper on the top left and bottom left that are known to have flown 1.6 kilometers in only four days. And a female then joined it at the same site. And this is a long way outside the release site, uh, the place in Rockingham Forest where the checkered skipper was released. And it's really telling as well, just to see the amount of life that these butterflies go through. The top right, is a very flesh male checker skipper, but only four days later, I found this tattered, weathered, just absolutely dilapidated looking male, uh, 400 meters away on another ride, still holding strong in his territory. And although the Back from the Brink project concluded in 2021, I'm delighted to say that funding has been received to continue the project under the guise of the Green Recovery Challenge Fund until March, 2023. No longer roots of rocking in, it's now known as checkered skippers taking flight and it will incorporate a, another release in Rockingham Forest this spring. But it's not just the checkered skipper that the restoration work, all the habitat management that's been going on in the background will help. Also the grizzled skipper, the dingy skipper, the adder, and even through the roots of rocking project, 15 other species were helped by the management work that's been undertaken. But the landscape of Rockingham Forest still faces challenges. Even now, a site, a meadow south of Weekly Hall Wood, just north of Kettering, is threatened by warehouse development. And that site is occupied by grizzled and dingy skipper, the same things that projects like this are targeting, improving the quality of habitats for. But we're in a new golden age now. Long gone are all the negative thoughts surrounding the extinction of 1976. The checkered skipper is back in England once more. We are in a new golden age, a new generation has arrived and we're hoping it's here to stay. Butterflies are fantastic 
because they're brilliant indicators of healthy environments and ecosystems. If you know a butterfly is present, if you've seen one there, you know a habitat is right somehow. You're doing something right with how you're managing the landscape. And both of those are important. Reintroductions are important because they're good for mental health and well-being. Can you imagine going a summer without seeing a butterfly? And they benefit, as I mentioned, wider, wider biodiversity as well, not just the checker skipper. Management work that's undertaken by the checker skipper helps a wide variety of species, not just the checker skipper. It helps other invertebrates like dragonflies. It helps things like bats. It helps things like birds and adders as well, not just butterflies and moths. And projects like this as well is also a fantastic opportunity for people like me to talk to you about projects like this. They're great for me to get a foothold in conservation and learn about the nuts and bolts of reintroductions, all the things that go on in the background that make a project like this a success. And reintroductions, first and foremost, bring this spectacular golden brown butterfly back to England. The checkered skipper is here and I'm delighted to say that from this year you can experience this very butterfly for yourselves. So, really to wrap up, how have I told this story? Well, museum specimens, private collectors, diaries, historic texts, reports, anecdotal evidence, they've all contributed to this huge data set. I started off with 266 records from the butterflies for the new millennium data set. And you can see from this graph on the right hand side just how massive an impact museum specimens like those from the Museum of Zoology at Cambridge have had on my research. They've enabled me to tell this story. It is through historic specimens that I'm able to recap the entire history of the Checker Skipper in England. I now have 3,534 complete records meeting my quality criteria that have been added to the BNM data set. 2,175 of those from museum specimens. And I'm delighted to say that we very recently had a paper published in the Journal of Natural Science Collections on the value of these museum specimens. But collectors did not result in the decline of the checkered skipper. They had a very marginal impact on populations. And because we have this great body of evidence held in museums and private collections, now they've improved our understanding of the checkered skipper. They've improved our understanding of decline. We wouldn't know the amount that we do if it were not for museum collections and preserved specimens. And I just want to give thanks really to a gentleman by the name of Adrian Russell, who did enormous work for me to help me understand the distribution and abundance of the Czech Escape Butterfly in Leicestershire and Rutland, who very sadly passed away in April. Um, Adrian, thank you so much for everything that you did for me. I'm so sorry, I'm never going to get another fantastic email from you because your paragraphs and paragraphs that you sent me were just a delight to read. So rest in peace, buddy. And that's really it. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I've got a ton of acknowledgements. Uh, thank you so much to the University of Northampton, Butterfly Conservation, its beds in Northampton, Cambridge and Essex branches, and so much to the University Museum of Zoology for inviting me along to tell my research story. Uh, my supervisors, Jeff Ollerton, Duncan McCulling and Nigel Bourne, and everybody who has contributed to the huge body of data that I've collected. Thank you so much. Over to you, Evie. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jamie. That was so nice to hear. I loved hearing about the whole history of the Checkered Skipper and all the ups and downs that came with it. That was such a roller coaster, wasn't it? <laughs> it was brilliant. I love the way you told it and it came, Thank you. came across. Um, also really great to hear how uh, museum collections uh, specimens can be used for conservation as well. Um, it's obviously a big topic with the Butterfly Through Time project. Massively. And, um, Yes, exactly. And I really did like your little checkered skipper um, butterfly flag that you had <laughs> on the map at the beginning. And you can see it go north, it just looks like it was going to invade or something. Yeah, 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 good. I'm glad you picked up on that. <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. That I wonderful, very much yeah. enjoyed putting that presentation together. I tend to have fun with them. I don't take them especially seriously because you know, they're meant to be entertaining and engaging. So that's the way I tend to like to go with them. <laughs> you did a brilliant job. Thank you. So, oh guys, I'm sure you're gonna have a lot of questions for Jamie after that presentation. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of a moment to just think about what you're gonna ask. And I'm just gonna ask if you could put them all in the Q&A chat. Um, it just helps filter through the questions, just makes that a lot easier uh, for us to go through. Um, while you guys are thinking, um, I'm just gonna pop a couple of links in the chat for you that are gonna be relevant Firstly, about to the Butterfly Through Time project, and then also about the different organizations that Jamie has mentioned as well, such as Back to the Brink. 
Um, so it's going to pop them all in the chat for everyone. These are some from Jamie's and I'm also going to pop a link to our questionnaire for you guys to fill out if you wish to. Um, hearing feedback from you guys um, really helps us to improve our uh, engagement events um, and online events such as this one for the future. So we really do appreciate if you do fill that out as well. So the questionnaire is just now going on the chat there. Cool, so I'm just gonna give you a couple of moments to think about some questions and then we can get going on the q and A. I I think we did have one question in the chat while you were speaking. So sure. just gonna make sure we give that one a chance to be answered. Sure. Okay, so our first question um, from Edward Pollard. Jamie, could you explain why Belgian butterflies are imported and not Scottish ones? Yes. Well, for the purposes of reintroduction, yes. Um, <clears throat> the Belgians were chosen for the reintroduction because essentially they have a different food plant. Um, the Scottish population feeds on purple moorgrass, whereas the Belgians feed on calamagrostis and brachypodium. And there's a lot of Calamagrostis and Brachypodium in Rocky and Forest, uh, especially in particular at the release site. So we chose the Belgians on the basis of the food plant. If we reintroduced the Scottish population to England, there's a chance that they wouldn't adjust to the food plants that were available. It might be a bit of a culture shock going from the purple moorgrass to the Calamagrostis and Brachypodium. But I do have a suspicion that they're quite adaptable, that they will utilize whatever broadleaf grasses are available. Uh, we have a lot of brachypodium in the wood at the start of the reintroduction project, but now we have more so in terms of calamagrostis. But that was the principal reason, really. It was based on food plant. Um, so yeah, that's why we went for the Belgians version of the Scottish. And we've got some fantastic Belgian collaborators on the continent uh, that have been absolutely brilliant to work with. So that relationship has helped us really do a lot of the work that we have done. Cool, brilliant. Thanks for that, Jamie. So, um, and our next question from Adam. How do you rule out observer bias when looking at the spread of records during the 19th century? Very good question, actually. There's a lot of dimensions to this. Um, I've talked with some people that have got quite a lot of experience with researching collectors and their habits. There's some good books out there. I've even got on my desk, if anybody's interested, um, I strongly recommend a book called The Aurelian Legacy. Uh, which is all about um, historic collectors. Um, and it tended to be that where the Checker Skipper was known to be particularly abundant at, collectors didn't really have an excuse to go elsewhere. They wouldn't search for new sites as they knew that they could get a lot of stock from one particular site. So there is a tendency to believe that there is some amount of bias because as I mentioned, if, if collectors were concentrated on these major strongholds like Castor Hanglands, like Furman, they weren't looking elsewhere. So you have to factor that in, which is why, although the museum collections, all the specimen data I've got paint a good picture about the distribution of the Chequers Skipper in England historically, it's never gonna tell the whole picture. There will always be gaps and voids. So you have to kind of draw the dot, draw lines between the dots in some way. Um, but yes, observer bias is something that we factor in and I have to think about that sometimes. But I think when you get to the point where you've got so many records, from a few sites you can quite confidently say that they were major strongholds it, it would only be that even if we pulled more records for other sites that, that were unheard of or diary entries and things like that it seems pretty conclusive from the amount of records that we've got that we've got a general idea where the checker skipper was really dominant in the english landscape in the 1900s and the 1800s but it's definitely something to factor in and i have considered it that there's going to be a certain amount of observer bias because collectors were typically traipsing up and down the same rise in the same woods that they knew so well Oh, brilliant. Thank you for that answer. Um, our next question is from Sam. Uh, thank you for your this fantastic presentation, Jamie. It's concerning how easily and silently butterfly populations can disappear. Is there any work being done to preempt uh, to preempt any future de declines of the checkered skipper? Presumably its status is still a little rocky. Mm. 
I'm glad Sam picked up on the fact, uh, tried to communicate in the presentation, just how quickly populations of butterflies can decline. It can happen so quickly. We've already lost the wall from Northamptonshire in the past 25 or so years, and we've seen significant declines of things like the small heath as well. And just because they're undergoing what we consider quite controlled declines, doesn't mean that they can't just disappear rapidly in a couple of decades. We need to do work to ensure that loss is managed and reversed um, because things can take us by surprise. Butterflies that we consider common now might not be common in 20 years, they might not exist in the country altogether. Certain species that aren't particularly common, that are quite isolated and specialist species like the checkered skipper could be similarly threatened if we don't commit to good woodland and landscape management. But yes, preempting the further decline, a lot of ongoing management work has been committed to in the Rocky and Forest landscape. Thankfully, we've got further funding through the Green Recovery Challenge Fund to support ongoing management work, but it is really important. And yeah, it's good that, that Sam picks up on this, that you need to commit to man management for years. You can't at the end of an introduction project, just say, that's it, rub your hands off and walk away and expect the checker skipper to do its work. You, there needs to be a commitment to ongoing management from landowners, from project partners, and that stuff doesn't happen for free. So Butterfly Conservation is continually doing a lot of work behind the scenes to ensure that people like Forestry England, um, other partner organisations that, that own sites in Rocky and Forest are committing to work that will continue to make habitats, landscapes, colonisable, habitable for the Sheker Skipper. But yeah, it's not, you know, I'm creating a really positive picture because it has been fantastic. It's been such a success to this point and it's taken us all off guard just how well it's gone. And I'm really optimistic about its future considering some of the mobility and dispersal that we've seen. But it's not just to take for granted that it's here now and it's going to stay. So we're all still obviously a bit nervous because it's the projects that the baby of a lot of chief of staff at BC now, and we want to see it succeed but we have to do everything in our power to make sure that's the case. So yes, I wouldn't necessarily call it rocky, but it's something we have to be so sensitive and be so proactive on. Mm. Yeah, that's something that really struck me as well, is just how rapidly that decline happened um, and how it did just sort of take everyone by surprise even. Um, so hopefully we're able to sort of learn our lessons from the past and uh, try uh, prevent that from happening in the future. I remember seeing the um, Back to the Brink program when it came out actually and um, seeing all the amazing re um, conservation work that they were doing. Because um, it's not just um, the checker skipper, is it? It's a whole no. variety of uh, species. No, no, well. for the Roots of Rockian project, yeah. So um, that's why reintroductions are fantastic, especially butterflies, because a lot of the work that we're doing for the checkered skipper helps other butterflies, other moths, other invertebrates, dragonflies, bats, birds, all sorts of things. Improving the landscape doesn't just do it for one species. And there are 15 other target species that form part of the Roots of Rockian project. So we've moved into a stage now where it's more focused on the checkered skipper and the grizzled and the dingy and the adder as well. But yeah, it just shows that the projects like this are beneficial for wider biodiversity. Definitely. Perfect, thank you, Jamie. Our next question is from Edie. Um, I may have missed this, so feel free to disregard. Uh, what, would, what would success mean to you in five and 10 years, locally and more broadly in science? Speaking as a researcher, not someone who's worked in a conservation organization like Butterfly Conservation for a great length of time, I'd say, looking at things from my perspective, I think the success of a project like the Checkered Skipper would justify future reintroductions it would justify managing habitat, managing landscape for butterflies because you're proving that projects like this work and that you can reverse extinctions and you can reverse declines. And it's not people necessarily in conservation that you have to prove that to, it's funders and people that are of a more generalist audience. It's councils working on pollinator schemes and creating butterfly banks and creating habitats out of nothing. It's governments, it's external funder organizations. So success of a project like this would be fantastic for butterfly conservation and its credibility and proving that the science works, that the meta population biology approach of creating these interconnected landscapes that are separated by very short distances that are hopefully recolonizable by the checker skipper, um, that creating landscapes like that works, that the science is sound, and then you can turn around hopefully to, to funders, to government organizations, external bodies, third parties, whoever it may be, landowners, that, hey, projects like this work, 
here's why you should do another one. And it's about reversing trends because we know that butterflies have declined in distribution and or abundance in, since 1976 by 76%. That's a colossal number. So if you can prove through the checker skipper reintroduction that, hey, we can bring them back and we can do it successfully and we can do it in a sustainable way, that's justification for further projects, but future reintroductions and management work more generally for butterflies and other invertebrates. Brilliant, yes, perfect. It'll be lovely to see more introduction projects like this in the future. So next question from Charles. Uh, with species decline such as, uh, such as with Checkers Skipper, has there been research into the effects of the huge increases in deer population? It's not something I know about, no. In, in all honesty, no, I would, if I, if I had an answer to that, I would say, I don't. <laughs> yeah. Fair is, enough. Is not, I mean, like we do see, um, one thing, one thing, one thing we see a lot in Rocking Forest is that there's very little understory in a lot of the woodland because there's a lot of deer grazing and you don't see so much of that in Belgium. There's a lot, the, the understory is a lot thicker. Um, so you almost have like a different, I don't know whether you, you call it perhaps like a stepping stones of, woodland up to the up to the canopy you don't just have the the main canopy and then everything underneath and nothing on the forest floor in belgium you tend to see more biodiversity on on, on the woodland floor so yeah it deer definitely has an impact on the habitat here versus belgium but i don't know about deer populations or whether any research has been conducted into them here no cool um so our next question from adam what are your thoughts on how species reintroductions will cope through climate change? Oh, I wish Andrew Bladden was here to talk about <laughs> this. <laughs> Andrew's, he would Andrew's be perfect, been, wouldn't he? Yeah, he would be, I'm going to like absolutely butcher this answer in comparison to, <laughs> to what he would, because uh, he's been, Andrew's been doing a fantastic amount of work on mi microclimates for butterflies and how climate change impacts butterfly species. But I think it's really important when you're reintroducing a butterfly like the checkers giver to the English landscape is not just consider what the climate is like now but what the climate will be like in 40 years and ensuring that there's enough there's enough variability there are enough microclimates within the landscape that the checkered skipper can utilize irrespective of what kind of climate change the landscape undergoes so our Belgian collaborators in conjunction with some staff at BC uh, published a paper a few years ago on climatic modelling for the checkered skipper and they determined that the rocky and forest landscape was suitable because even with a certain amount of climate warming over the next half half a half a century it would still be suitable for the checkered skipper so yeah it's it's really important to do that with any reintroduction projects it's a fundamental component nowadays that we have to factor in considering how rapidly um we're undergoing climate change, how quickly, how quickly the earth is warming, that you aren't reintroducing checker skipper or any species of butterfly to a landscape that will be inhospitable due to climate change in a few short years. But yes, um, yeah, I strongly recommend Adam sends Andrew an email for more information on that because yeah, he's been doing fantastic work on the impact of um, climate on butterflies. Brilliant. Um, that's Andrew Bladen um, at Cambridge <laughs> University, if you're interested. Um, cool. It's lovely to hear that you guys are factoring in um, modelling of climate change into your research already. So um, just nice to know that there is that flexibility in there for these reintroduction projects. Um, so our last question comes from Peter. Has, have there been observable changes in parasites slash predators um, depending on the checkered skipper, either with its, with its decline or its reintroduction? I don't think we know about any parasites that are specifically associated with the checkered skipper. So we go through a, like a biosecurity protocol in conjunction with, I forget the name of the organization now, it's totally slipped my mind. Um, but yes, there's, there's an organization in London, no, the, um, the ZSL, the Zoological Society of London, yes. Um, we go through a biosecurity protocol. So any checkered skipper that's brought into the country is, study very closely to make sure it's not bringing any foreign bodies, any parasites into the country, because obviously that would be disastrous for our native species. Um, but I don't know of any parasites that are specifically associated with, with the checkered skipper. Um, but predators, predators is an interesting point. I saw a checkered skipper being chased after uh, 
by a dragonfly last year. <laughs> and that checkered skipper, let me tell you, engaged afterburners as soon as this dragonfly came up behind it and whipped off at a speed I've never seen a butterfly fly at in its life. It went from about 15 or 20 miles an hour to what seemed like about 150 in the space of a tenth of a second and flew up to the top of the canopy with this dragonfly screaming after it. Um, it managed to evade it, fortunately, but other butterflies I've seen in Rockingham Forest have not been so lucky that they have fallen foul of these dragonflies. I've seen one feasting on a speckled wood. So the habitat will be, as I mentioned, improved for other invertebrates like dragonflies. And I haven't done enough work on other taxa to look at the abundance of butterfly, uh, sorry, dragonfly species. But there's a good possibility that as the habitat improves, that maybe dragonfly numbers will as well, because we're improving the habitat for them too. So we could see checker skippers being predated by more dragonflies. Um, but yeah, in terms of predators with decline, they're typical for any butterfly species, you know, but things like birds, um, yeah, dragonflies, maybe even a spider. And I think I've seen a, an instance of a, of a spider hanging around a perched checkered skipper in years past that, that it may have fallen uh, prey to, but um, no direct competition or predators that, that could potentially compromise the reintroduction or that I know about prior to its extinction in England. Brilliant. I really wish you uh, had that on film. The <laughs> dragonfly and chicken skipper little fly off race. There, yeah, <laughs> there, there are so many experiences I wish I had on film. I've got quite a lot of footage, um, but they're mostly of checker skippers when they've been inert on the tops of grass blades roosting and getting ready to overnight. Brilliant. I think we've just got a couple more in the chat. Uh, I did notice one. Um, oh, yes. Um, is there anything we can do as individuals? Fantastic question. Not necessarily for the checker skipper, because at the moment it's only been reintroduced to Rockingham Forest, so it's, it's not across England. But for butterflies more generally, absolutely. There's so much individuals can do. Um, if you know what type of butterfly species are local, that are in your area, so if you know that there are peacocks and there are small tortoise shells or there are blues or orange tips, plant some wildflowers in your garden and cultivate them for those specific butterflies. It's making sure that you're providing nectar sources for species that you know you have locally. And if you plant them, they will come. So things like wildflower planting are fantastic in your garden. If you've got more space and a bit more money, you can create small meadows in your gardens that, that then have food plants for the butterflies all year round. So they'll serve all stages of the life cycle. You can create things like butterfly banks, which are fantastic. There are some good guides that butterfly conservation have. So you can create fantastic microclimatic variability, great some really warm banks that are facing the sun that are good specifically for butterfly species. But yes, nectar sources are fantastic. So if you can plant wildflowers, that's great. Even if you go into habitats looking for butterflies as well, uh, if you know you're somewhere that the, that the specific butterfly, for example, the checkered skipper is quite vulnerable. There's a very small population. Make sure you do simple things like being very sympathetic to the environment. Don't damage the habitat too much. Don't damage too many nectar sources. Don't damage too many food plants because that's obviously the butterfly's home and that's what it needs to survive. So it's sympathy to the environment, but also proactiveness on, on your side as well, what you can do on your own land. And even going to council meetings and telling councillors that you want to see verges left unmowed to, so that wildflowers can come up of their own accord, see more dandelions, more poppies and more things like that. But don't just encourage checkered skipper, encourage other butterflies, but also things like bumblebees to propagate. So it's really important to consider all pollinators across the spectrum really, but yes, um, butterfly banks, no mowing, creating your own meadows, wildflower planting, there's so much dust that you can do in the comfort of your own garden. Brilliant answer. Uh, and just building on your point a little bit there, um, you mentioned no may, um, no mo may, which is a bit large scheme on from plant life, um, which actually runs throughout May, just a massive worldwide campaign to encourage people not to mow in the month of May. And what that does is just lets the, the sward grow, lets like wildflowers grow, especially in the, the month of May when lots of things are growing in the spring months um, and hopefully get a bit of bloom. Um, which will obviously provide some nectar sources um, for butterflies as well as bees and other insects as well. 
Um, so just to touch on that, I've also um, put in some links in the chat on how you can get involved with system science. So you can start monitoring and recording butterflies as well. You can even do this on your phone on an app, um, namely iRecord, I think is the one um, yeah. that we're, we use at the museum, yes, in particular. And also some links on how you can garden for your butterflies as well. Um, but just to touch upon that, Evie, I record absolutely fantastic. But people can record the butterflies. That's the substitute now. We've got technology that means we don't have to collect butterflies. We don't have to capture them in nets anymore. It's fantastic to have apps like I record because then we can understand distribution, abundance, declines, increases in real time. And county recorders that butterfly conservation have analyze that data annually so we can have like a real-time look at how butterflies are doing and react accordingly we can do it a lot quicker and we won't necessarily be by be taken off guard like the researchers were in the 1970s studying the checker skipper so yeah i encourage anyone who's remotely interested in recording download the really really easy to use iRecord app and start logging some butterfly sightings because they're incredibly beneficial for science Brilliant. What a lovely note to end on. We as the people can stop this happening again by using all our um, citizen science and the powers of our phone and technology that we have at our disposal. Uh, we can stop these sudden shocks of population decline ever happening again. So brilliant. Oh, thank you so much, Jamie. It's been a lovely talk. It's been lovely having you. Um, so just a note to end on. Um, our, so the second talk in our researchers talk, um, researchers story series. Uh, our next one will be with uh, Galena jo Johnson. Um, it will be on the 18th of May, and she's going to be talking about pinning down the butterfly effect and her work and digitalizing the Natural History Museum's butterfly collection. So make sure you tune into that if you're interested. Um, it's going to be the same link as this, this one that which you received um, the Zoom link on your email today. So brilliant. Um, once again, thank you so much, Jamie. I think we've answered all the questions now, um, but I know that that was a phenomenal talk for me and I'm sure everyone else has enjoyed it. So thank you once again. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you to the University of New Zealand Zoology as well for inviting me because it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you.